Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Patrick Blazer. I'm the group manager for trajectory-based operations. Good morning, Phil Hargarden. Um, I am the NACA trajectory-based operations Article 114 representative, and I'm also on the Northeast Corridor. Um, kind of want to echo what uh, has been previously said. It's really great after what two and a half years now to be in a room with everybody and be face to face with a lot of friends and colleagues that haven't seen in a long time. Uh, next slide. So uh, for TBO, uh, work that's been ongoing and still coming uh, for implementation milestones. Um, I'm not going to sit here and read this whole slide to you, even though, even though it's my only one today, which is kind of nice. Um, but so for Denver, we've got the Denver Metroplex implementation. Uh, extended metering has been implemented uh, for Denver, and IDAC has been uh, installed and implemented in uh, various facilities in the, in the uh, Denver area, uh, Aspen, Colorado Springs, uh, Centennial and Denver Tower. As mentioned before, TSAS is on hold for both uh, Denver and for LA. Uh, the Las Vegas Metroplex uh, was implemented and uh, EOR at LAX. Uh, EOR was um, a pretty big lift. It came out of Section 547 for reauthorization. Uh, it was a lot of hard work by people in the facilities, people in the service center and headquarters to uh, get that implemented. And it uh, has proven to be very, very productive. Uh, XM for Las Vegas is uh, being worked on and Northeast Corridor. Uh, as mentioned before, we have the Philly uh, Newark co-location going on right now. Once that's done, we are still planning and looking at doing the uh, Philly uh, ske departure scheduling in on the glass metering and for NAS wide. Uh, EDC, PDRR, uh, ABRR, except for New York Center. Uh, Datacom services, as was mentioned before, is being rolled out. Uh, DFMS, IDAC at all centers, uh, and part of that uh, in completing IDAC for all the centers in support of uh, TFDM, and then the TF, uh, DM, TFDM initial sites for 2024. All right, so Phil kind of touched on high level over what we've been accomplished and ongoing work. Now I'll go a little bit more in detail. Uh, so for Northwest Mountain in Denver, um, I'm just going to gloss over it a bit because Brandon Smith from the TBFM Ops team will be going more in depth on Denver here in a second. Uh, so Denver was one of the first three, as Michelle mentioned in her introduction. Uh, Denver was, is, is really the, the furthest optimized TBO operating area we have. Um, so at this point, because of all the uh, new stars, new SIDs, new root structure that Metroplex introduced, along with the PBN, RNP, curve path approaches, uh, we implemented uh, a new arrival system and, and then built the next M system off of it, as you saw in the videos, um, as well as, as Phil just mentioned, we implemented IDAC uh, in July of this year for the four towers, Denver, Collar Springs, Aspen, and Centennial. Um, so at this point, there's really not much more to do for Denver. Um, you know, obviously TSAS is on hold, but besides that, they have the initial data come rolling in. I think they're scheduled for the beginning part of next year, and then they're on the waterfall list for TFDM. But at this point, Denver is probably one of the most successful, or at least the furthest optimized of our operating areas. As we go into the Southwest, um, LAX and, and Vegas, uh, this kind of started, and I'll go into it in a little bit, a new strategy that we're doing for TBO implementation. So originally when the Southwest operating area was named, uh, myself and the TBFM uh, co-lead along with some others made a trip down to LA Center to kind of just start the conversation because we needed to introduce extended metering from Oakland into LA for LAX. Uh, when we were down at the facility, uh, we were listening to the workforce and all they talked about was Vegas, 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 Vegas. They just implemented Metroplex uh, industry, uh, you know, rescheduled the arrivals. It increased into Vegas over COVID. Uh, and they asked us, you know, listen, we want help for LAX, but we really need help for Vegas. And so this changed our entire uh, game plan into there. And so now we, we basically went from scratch. We looked at what needs to be done for the arrival system. Um, during that investigation, we learned that you know, we can improve their arrival system, but we also need to introduce an extended metering system um, for Vegas to be fully optimized. So um, our team has been working for about two years now on that. We've implemented the arrival, uh, we, we've implemented parts of the arrival system for Vegas, and then coming up in the end of October, early November, we'll now be uh, IOCing on the extended metering system for Vegas. Uh, so 
on the map and on the video, as it kind of shows, uh, that'll be four adjacent centers will be metering into LA Center. So it'll be Oakland Center, Salt Lake, Denver, and Albuquerque, all metering into Vegas. Uh, so we're really excited about that. It's gonna be a, a really busy fall for us for the Southwest. Um, at the same time, we implemented uh, some T2T -T connectivity from Oakland Center to schedule into ZLA systems, uh, San Diego's arrival system as well as uh, along with Vegas, we will be right after we implement Vegas, after a, a little bit of burn-in time for Oakland Center, we're gonna have them start metering into LAX as well. So Albuquerque Center already meters for LAX arrivals, but now we're gonna add the coastline down in as well. Um, so one of the big benefits of that, as Phil mentioned on the EOR, the curve path approaches, what we noticed with Denver, and there'll be some slides later on when Almut's presenting, once we optimized Denver, we saw their RNP usage uh, pre-October of last year, they averaged around 2,000 to 2,500 RNP approaches each month. After we implemented our XM system, we're getting more predictability, we're getting a better throughput. Now their RNP usage has skyrocketed up to around 4,000 per month. And we're seeing that because of a better schedule, a more optimized TVFM system, we're also enhancing the RNP usage. And so we're hoping with the Southwest, we'll get the same benefits. Um, and then with that, uh, right now, once we implemented EOR, I think Wendy mentioned it, uh, prior to October of last year, they averaged like 15 to 50 RNP a, a month. It really wasn't being used ever since we implemented EOR authorization along with the CRDA for the, for the controllers. They're now around 600 a month. So that's been great. And then uh, final work we're doing. So EDC departure scheduling system for Scottsdale. This actually just needs to be updated a, a little bit more, but um, Again, we are in Albuquerque Center working on some, some work for Denver and Salt Lake and, and uh, Vegas. Uh, same thing, the workforce, we, we're listening to them and they're saying, hey, we got Super Bowl coming up in February of next year. Uh, we're just getting slammed with Scottsdale. During COVID, the, the traffic pattern has shifted in Scottsdale. They're getting a lot more arrivals. They're getting a lot busier. So they asked, is there anything we can do? So taking the budgetary uh, constraints into it, we couldn't give them a full arrival system. However, we did. Uh, add them to the Tracon group for P50. Uh, so now uh, we can schedule into the arrival system into that for, for both Deer Valley and Scottsdale. Uh, so we'll be looking at doing that again around the October, November time period. It's gonna be a really busy uh, fall for us. Uh, next slide. Uh, so now the NEC, uh, I think we've all touched on this. Once the Newark Philly initiative is done, uh, then we'll be looking at doing the departure scheduling back into there. But in the meantime, uh, this spring, summer, we just finished adding uh, IDAC to four more towers into the NEC, so uh, Allentown, Atlantic City, Islip, and Middleton all have IDAC now as well. And then uh, last year, we added T2T -T connectivity for the NEC to schedule directly into Atlanta and Charlotte's arrival system. Um, and then ACR, the Atlantic Coast Routes, uh, this has been ongoing for a couple of years now. Um, we've been slowly implementing uh, small incremental uh, milestones, but it'll be fully completed in June of next year. Uh, now we'll talk about Florida. So Florida, obviously, as Lakeisha talked about, this has been the big hot, hot item for everyone, as everyone knows. Um, back in around March timeframe, myself and the TBFM Ops uh, co-lead for NACA went down there along with the command center to listen to the workforce, understand what the issues were. Um, obviously, you know, it's a lot more than just what TBFM can take care of, but we wanted to see what we could do to help. So now we've uh, implemented a EDC system for Opelika. It's an airport that's kind of wedged between Miami and Fort Lauderdale. Uh, it gets really busy, so they wanted some help on that. Um, IDAC, we're looking forward to implementing IDAC at six of the towers there. So Miami and Fort Lauderdale will be coming up in a couple weeks. And then Fort Myers, Palm Beach, Tampa, and Fort Lauderdale Executive will be uh, hopefully by the end of this calendar year. And the reason we added all those IDAC is because our big project we're working on right now is a EDC departure scheduling. Um, this will be the first time we've done something like this. So we are connecting four different centers into one single system. It's very similar to what we did with the Atlanta and Charlotte arrival system for the NEC, except for instead of scheduling into arrival system, it's just scheduling into EDC. However, this is the first time we're connecting Indy Center, Atlanta, Jackson, Miami, all into one. Uh, what we're seeing right now is there's massive passback delays for O'Hare arrivals. And, you know, um, Jacksonville is launching departures at the same time as Miami because they're not aware of each other. So this will be one single system with integrated information, as it shows here. And uh, we're hoping that this will be successful and then we can build on this and expand it into a massive northbound departure system after this. 
and then um, an additional project we're starting to look at now as well is for Palm Beach to see if this is something we can uh, help them out with just an EDC, EDC system or if we will have to do an arrival system as well. But again, as everyone touched on, that all relies on the budget. And then South Central, uh, again, as you'll hear is, a, is a, a common theme. We were doing site visits. We're listening to the workforce. Uh, we originally went to Houston Center to talk about IDAC because as Phil mentioned, we were trying to implement IDAC across the NAS. Uh, when we were there, you know, they, they started harping on, listen, during COVID, Austin, the traffic has just skyrocketed. We need help. Same with the metering systems for Intercontinental and Hobby. They're, it's an outdated system, and they wanted to see if the TBFM ops team can help them out, you know, investigate the, the infrastructure, the, the configs, uh, all the adaptations, see if there's anything we can do to help. Uh, so now we're currently working on the EDC departure scheduling system for Austin. Uh, we'll be implementing that here shortly. And then that will be just internal to Houston Center. That's the first step. And then we'll be looking to expand that out as well so that uh, uh, other adjacent centers are scheduling as well. And then uh, if budget allows, build on that to do an arrival system as well for Austin. Um, after we're done with the first phase of Austin, we are then going to circle back to Houston Hobby and Intercontinental and work on their arrival systems. Uh, so there's a lot of work being done right now by the TBFM Ops team and others, uh, SLE, the program office, all of that. But uh, basically what we're showing, if you go to the next slide, please. Uh, we have noticed during the, really during the pandemic that we initially focused on just the four operating areas after the Southwest was named. But that was the foundation, you know, along with one key airport. But what we've seen is you know, if we're listening to industry, if we're listening to the workforce, we need to expand NAS wide. And a lot of the projects, you know, if you look at the Northwest, when we added XM, that really encompassed six different operating areas. If you talk to the Northeast quarter, that's four different operating areas. Southwest, four or five as well. So at this point, we are now being more agile. We're listening and we're, we're moving NAS wide. Uh, the, you know, if you take Florida, for example, a year ago, we had no plans to be doing IDA, we had no plans to be helping out with that, but we listened to the needs of industry, we listened to the needs of the workforce, and now we're, we're making the decision to go in there and help them out. Same with uh, Houston area, same exact situation there. We're gonna, we listen to them, we listen to what you guys have done with your changing of your, of your, uh, of your scheduling, and now we're going in there to help out. Uh, same with um, O'Hare and you know Salt Lake, um, we'll look to add IDAC there as well. So. Basically, our new updated strategy for TBO integration is to drop just being pigeonholed into four operating areas and listen to all the users, listen to their workforce, and see what we can do to help. And at the same time, you know, as we've talked about airspace modernization, and you'll hear Jim talk about this at the end of the, of the presentation, we need to be lockstep with them, and they need to be lockstep with us, and we recognize that. And so this is going to change up how we're, how we're strategizing our implementation efforts moving forward. Uh, we need to be working together. We need to collaborate. And then, um, obviously, as the as the last bullet uh, reads, and you're going to hear it time and time again today, all of the scope of future work is always dependent on the budgetary allocations. Uh, the TBFM Ops team has been really creative, taking the budget into account. You know, whether it's an EDC system instead of an arrival system, we're we're, we're thinking about all of that. We're thinking about what what is actually going to be beneficial to the workforce, what's going to be beneficial to industry. And that's kind of how we've adjusted our strategy is is to get away from just operating areas, and now we're moving NAS wide. Questions. Lee, you're up. I have three. Um, let's start with a high level one and then work back. Um, you talk about the budgetary limitations. Uh, I'm assuming that's both FE and ops limitations. Is there one that's a bigger pain in the tuchus than the other? Not really, no. Uh, it's just, you know, a lot of the work we do with TBFM takes a lot of customization. It takes a lot of work on that and that's just something we have to you know we just have such a limited budget and so we have to spread the wealth you know on all these projects and so we're just being very strategic on what what we can do and what we can so but to answer answer your question now um second question um so uh rob briefed and and you all have touched on it today the tsas deferral it, does deferral mean like n nothing's going on is there continuing work on refining the capabilities now, at this point, it is it's, it's kind of on the shelf, if you will. I, you know, we we've done our testing up until a couple months ago. We're in a pretty good spot. If we do ever come back, you know, if we come back out of it, I think we're in a pretty, yeah. I would say no. At this point, there's no ongoing work. Okay, so caught us still to that. that a little bit too. You know, with uh, Denver, obviously they already have CRDA. Right. Um, LAX uh, CRDA has been implemented in LAX, and it's been 
very successful. I know there's updates coming to CRDA to improve the curb path feature in CRDA. So um, I would I would expect that CRDA is going to be looked at in a lot more places possibly in the future as budget allows and all that. But it's been very successful in LA. I, that was the follow up to the second was. Are yeah. we going to see enhancement to CRDA? So yeah, you. yeah. So CRDA is our bread and butter right now for the Traycon to help with sequencing. You know, we saw, you know, obviously in Denver, I've I've seen it firsthand how how beneficial it is. We brought it to LAX, and now we're looking at other Traycons that are doing R and P curve paths. You know, how can we help them out with that? Because it really is a TSAS light, if you will. It's helping with the sequencing of those R and Ps. Yeah. Last question, um, which I think I know the answer to, uh, but um, so PDRR and ABRR. Um, I, I, with the, not in New York. Um, does that mean never in New York or does that mean not New York right now? And is there a timeline kind of sort of associated with that? Yeah, um, I would say, yeah, th there's not a timeline at this point. Um, yeah, it's to be determined. And that's related to the issues with the pit or is there and, something and else? Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Lee, for you or for everyone else, um, with the TSAS deferral, I just want to point out that that has given us more resources to do all the work, especially the Florida work um, that Patrick and Phil have talked about. Um, it's kind of opened that up and also given us um, room to look at it from a NAS wide as far as efficiencies, because we did see we've seen a lot of efficiency, as you're going to hear um, with the work we've done in Denver and some of the other places, and we want to build on that efficiency. So. Yeah. I don't, I don't, there wasn't anything implied about an answer that we wanted or didn't want. I just think that since the NAC, there's been, I think, some speculation about what deferral or the TBDs meant and just wanting the clarification. Yeah, and, and for TSS, it was not just budgetary. There were multiple facets along with that um, for, to make that decision. Just want to make that clear as well. So, um, and as you've heard, um, from Aaron and Dan and Patrick and Phil, we have opportunities where the field is coming back and asking for assistance and help in their areas, which means we have buy-in and we have change management. So that's really good. This this concept is working. It's it's helping us move the NAS into what you guys have wanted with predictability, flexibility, fuel efficiency, and throughput. So we, we're working that continually, and we have made that change, which is really, really good. So with that, I am going to introduce um, one of our metric teams, um, Alma, Almira Ramadani, Dave Noor, and Kurt Rademacher. And they are going to talk about TBO opportunities to improve um, performance in the NAS. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this TBO industry day is focusing on performance. So up to now, we were providing updates with respect to recent accomplishments, change in planning, but from now on, it's going to be as geeky as you can imagine. We have included quite a few charts in the slides that have already been posted on TBO website. For you, we do not intend to discuss every single chart in that briefing, but if you have any questions whatsoever with respect to any of the material that we put together for you, um, you know you have access to TBO email, shoot those questions to us and we can uh, answer them that way if they don't get answered here today. So, opportunities to improve performance in the NAS is a very elaborate, uh, extensive analysis that we have been working on together with MITRE, uh, SysOps, air traffic services, and program management organization. There were actually quite a few other people involved in this work, but those were the people leading the whole effort. If you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, as you will see, this effort builds on past efforts. Uh, this is a lot bigger, a lot more complicated, a lot more complex than uh, the work in support of establishing the first four operating areas was back in the day. Um, that being said, the work is not finished. We are building on that foundation as pretty much I speak. We are expanding the metrics that we are looking at. We are expanding the evaluation methodologies. We are trying to be more detail oriented and all of that will make sense a little more in a second. 
Uh, on this particular slide, we're just reminding you of the material we shared with you in the past, the first three TBO industry days. In the upper left, you see the um, life cycle uh, for deployment of new capabilities that the FAA um, is operating under and the conversation that we had uh, in November last year that talked about uh, opportunities, expectations and achievements and how metric from one time frame uh, connect to metrics to the other and how that whole circle uh, actually works. In the lower right corner, you will recall that we discussed different time frames for analysis. Sometimes you need to know something about operations as operation is unfolding. Sometimes you want to look at what happened the day before and learn, hopefully, a few things from, from experiences from day before. But what we do here for the TBO assessment uh, analysis really lives in this third time frame, which is more of a seasonal or, or annual or, or post-deployment kind of analysis that requires looking at trends observed over a uh, longer time frame. So it's not just a particular hour, it's not just a particular day or a particular flight, even though that could well be um, providing valuable insight. Uh, we're really starting with this long period of time, looking at how things happen, how those trade-offs that Wendy mentioned just a second ago between uh, changes in throughput, flight efficiency, predictability and flexibility, how those trade-offs really jive and what it all means. Uh, on the next slide, what are we trying to accomplish with this analysis of opportunities? Um, as uh, Patrick and Phil just mentioned too, we are expanding the scope to the broader NAS. We are not only looking at one operating area at a time anymore, but in order to improve flows in and out of any particular operating area, we really need to see how those flows fit into the bigger NAS picture. So 52 airports is that starting point for the whole NAS. And you're going to say there are thousands of airports in the NAS. 52 is too small of a number. Um, but when you see how detailed this analysis is, when you know that we are looking at every single flight in and out of every single one of these airports, um, we need to work with cold rates. We need to work with weather information and many other really detailed um, data sets that are currently disconnected from the rest of them and we need to figure out a way of integrating that whole picture together, 52 airports very quickly becomes uh, a really large number and a really complicated analysis. These are the 52 most significant airports in the NAS and I'm putting quotes around those most significant because that's a relative term, of course. Um, the significance is determined in terms of the volume of flights they serve, in terms of how close they may be to a bigger airport that may be more significant than another one on, on that list. But for these 52 airports, we have a complete set of data that we are studying at this time, uh, building this evaluation framework, evaluating metrics for, um, and we will be expanding this list as we can going forward as well. The idea is that no improvement at any particular site should be treated as a silo from the last of the NAS. The ad another idea that adds complexity, if you will, another dimension of complexity is that no improvement of its own should be a silo from other improvements that one might need to consider at exactly the same place, not even in the rest of the NAS. So that's this tools versus procedures side. You are all very much aware about airspace modernization work uh, that we are supporting right now. Um, this work fits in very nicely. It's like one big puzzle that has its own puzzle pieces that click next to each other. So whether we need to improve tools or procedures or both or processes or it's, you know, something else that needs to happen at any of these sites, it needs to be observed at the same time that call about, you know, the complete set of improvements that would truly enhance efficiency of that part of the NAS and the NAS overall needs to be made. That call needs to be made at the same time. And then we can take those improvements 
and turn them into reality one at a time. But assessment of what and how and where uh, happens, you know, at that higher level. So that's our starting point. From there, on the next slide, we start talking about the process and how far we got. Um, you know, all of those organizations I mentioned earlier have provided their data and brain power, and we put our heads together and talked about what matters. What is that opportunity space that TBO or airspace modernization or something else on our end can uh, help uh, bring uh, benefits to the system, right? Um, so we started small. And that small is even bigger quotes than previously, because the metrics that we considered, which you will see uh, in a second, are very complicated. But all those metrics really deal with, do we, are we constraining the system too much today or not enough in some parts of the NAS? Are the delay assignments too high or not high enough and as a result of that, we are creating gridlocks or, or you know, congestion points someplace. Uh, is there a better way to manage NAS? Th that's our starting point, right? Um, so there are seven critical metrics. Uh, you will see more about them in a second, of course, that we evaluated across the board. So for each of those 52 airports, for every single arrival during um, Winter 22, which started on November uh, 1st, 2021, finished at the end of March um, 2022, right? It's somewhat arbitrary time period, to be honest. Um, we wanted to have a long enough time period that allows for our metrics to break, our evaluation methodologies to break. So we really wanted to push uh, our approach to, to, to you know, to maximum. But um, we also wanted to start uh, on November 1st because we know that airline schedules started ramping up uh, post COVID in significant ways then. So we wanted to have comparable time periods pre COVID to today. So all of those decisions were driving the dates. However, going forward, MITRE really did help us by uh, developing uh, evaluation methodology that is easy to repeat. So it's not exactly push of a button, but very close to it. So in the future, in next fiscal year, we're going to repeat the same uh, processes to expand our analysis time periods to apply to different seasons, um, maybe more precisely manage the start and end days of um, periods that we need to compare and, and, and so forth. So for now, 52 airports, uh, six months worth of data, fully evaluated, um, evaluation methodology fully flushed and validated as well. That's where we are. We are just at the point where we can start interpreting the data. So please set your expectations where, <laughs> where we can meet them successfully. Um, we will be able to share everything we developed, but Keep in mind that we haven't had a chance to think through it yet, so we cannot come with recommendations of any sort uh, just yet. That's the work that needs to happen next. So on the next slide. This is the definition of opportunity space. So on the left side of this slide, uh, let me actually take a step back real quick. Uh, opportunities to improve performance can be tackled in one of two different ways. We can look at average flight that arrives to a particular site to one of those 52 airports and say, what are the typical delays? What is the range of delays? What are the issues that are good and bad that are associated with that average flight? And by looking at opportunities in that sense, one puts small airports on the same playing field as large airports. So it happens at White Plain or Van Nuys, average flight, right? It's an average flight arriving to those locations. Um, that pl playing field is level irrespective of uh, the importance, if you will, of that particular airport to the whole system. On the other hand, instead of looking at average flight, we can look at total opportunity to improve efficiencies, where we basically sum all of those opportunities across all of the flights arriving to, to one of those 52 airports. And at that point, 
uh, places like O'Hare and Atlanta are going to jump up, right, and become a lot more important than Van Nuys or White Plains. So we don't really know what's better, to be honest, because sometimes the small airports uh, help resolve issues that affect large nearby airports in a good way. Um, sometimes the issues at certain locations are so large that no matter how small or large the airport is, we need to do something about it, right? So just because we are not exactly sure how those things trade between each other, uh, what we started is we casted a very broad net. So we are looking at it across the board. We are looking at average flights um, and define opportunity space through the metrics listed on the left, as well as we are looking at total opportunities and metrics listed on the right. So what does that mean? Uh, if you go to the next slide, um, the first nerdy thing I'm sharing with you today. So it's a very busy slide, but it's really very much informative. The chart on the far left shows interquartile ranges for volumes observed during our winter time period at each of the 52 airports. So how do you read this chart? Um, each airport is a row. You know, they're organized in exactly the same shape uh, order rather in each of these four charts. And the chart on the left shows typically observed um, daily arrivals to each of the sites. So for, um, let's say, Atlanta, for example, we see around 970 flights per day. That's a median value. But that 970 per day median really is between 800 and 1,000 flights a day range. So what happens on a day when you serve 1,000 flights is really not comparable to what happens on a day when you serve 800 flights. Maybe certain portions of the day are directly comparable, but the day overall uh, is not going to be. So chart like this allows you to step away from averages and single numbers that we tend to do in the past. Um, that's easier analysis, of course, right? You just generate one number and work with it. Uh, it's more difficult to look at a range, but this range allows you to study um, the benefits of time-based management better because time-based management will not have the same needs, will not be addressing the same needs when the flows are really condensed and, and, and you know, um, very small spacings between aircraft versus when things are not as busy. The chart, second chart from the left is, we stay on the same page if you can, please. Uh, second chart from the li uh, left is about um, utilization of existing capacity uh, at each of the 52 airports. So volume that they're serving followed by that demand to capacity ratio. The orange line is proportion of time periods when capacity is exceeded, 75% uh, of capacity is exceeded, and the little red line in the middle of the orange for each side is proportion of times when 95% of capacity is exceeded. So that's another view. So whether we want to go and look at opportunity spaces where we have a lot of aircraft served on average single day may not be as critical on its own as when we overlap that same information with whether we have sufficient capacity at the same time, same site or not, right? We can have an airport with enormous number of flights per day, but if they have the sufficient capacity to serve them, that's not really a big dot on our radar, no pun intended. Uh, the third chart from the left is um, over constraining of the system. It's a new methodology that Mitre is still working on. Um, so it's pretty novel. We are very much excited about it because it's focusing on flights that had uh, delay assignments and arrived to each of the 52 locations during time periods when they were not really busy. So the question is, why were those flights um, delayed, 
to begin with. It could be a reason further back upstream. It could be alignment of planets. We don't really know, but now we know where it happens, when it happens, which flights those are, so we can study them at greater level of uh, detail. So that's another dimension in the opportunity space. On its own, insufficient, but complementary to everything else, very, very much important. MITs on the far right, um, you heard us say over and over again that we believe uh, use of MIT restrictions will be reduced with increased use of time-based management and time-based management efficiency of um, managing flows through TBM means is greater because we delay only those flights that have to be delayed, not everybody that belongs to the same flow necessarily. Um, so MIT stringency and proportion of stringency that is um, applicable to arrival flows to each of the 52 locations is clearly a very important part of the opportunity space. Um, and on the next slide, we have sequencing delay. Dave, would you like to explain this part? This is work conducted by NextGen office. Um, very proud of it. I'll let Dave explain. Wow, that's hard to follow, Alma. You can see why she would have been a terrific professor and was slated to be a, no, really, you have a gift for um, going through detailed information. But I'm gonna try, on the left, sequencing delay. This is what we were calling necessary sequencing delay. It's very clear from all our data that when you have more aircraft in the TRACON, you end up flying a longer distance. Air controllers don't take you for a longer distance for the hell of it in the TRACON. It's always related to the amount of traffic. And we have some wonderful graphics outside in our booth in the corner which show you how the amount of distance flown in the TRACON is related to how many are in there before you, which would mean long downwinds or other vectors to able to handle the traffic. So that's why it's sequencing delay. And where is he? Mr. Bro Mr. Broaden actually came up with the term sequencing delay as opposed to necessary delay. Um, but that's that's really what's on the 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 left side is the amount of delay with in nautical miles both within the tracon area and within the 120 miles closest to the airport um, how much vectoring and the vectoring related to sequencing um, the other thing when you have a lot of traffic you also see more level offs you you've seen me present some of you before and if we're in low traffic times you see pretty much CDOs. I mean, CDOs aren't, they're not some magical invention. That's what happens when there's nobody in front of you. Um, but we level off when we're trying, when we have other traffic or when we're trying to absorb some delay. So both of these measures, level off delay and sequencing delay are complementary, and they're tied to demand to capacity imbalances in small periods. So they're great indications of where we can improve by potentially moving delay back, as Michelle said earlier, to a more efficient phase of flight. Um, okay, well, I said actually the left side is within 40 and the two to the right are between 40 and 120. Most of the delay, most of the sequencing delay is taken inside the TRACON. But when things get busy, we do start to um, vector and you will see level offs, both of these outside of, of 40 miles. So they're, they're an indication of demand exceeding capacity and they're an indication of where maybe you could move delay back to a more efficient place, of course. What we always have to do is we have to keep throughput up. All of this is done the way it's done today because I, I think most controllers in here would argue they're trying to keep throughput up. They're trying to keep pressure on that airport. So it's all, it's, that's why there's not a negative connotation to this. This is all maybe an opportunity, but it's a, it's a careful opportunity with sophisticated tools, with IDAC 
and with 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 TBO to move it back. Yep. Thank you, Dave. Um, we can go to the next slide. So, how do we use all of those charts? We thought that visual representation of the same um, findings would be easier to to digest. Um, you know, without deeper studies. So the very first thing we did was look at relative. Um, not ratios, but relative positions, if you will, um, of each airport on our list with respect to each one of those opportunity spaces. So here on this slide, I believe it's um, yes. Capacity being 75% uh, of capacity being exceeded by by throughput. So if you look only at that matrix, how often do we see each of the airports truly congested? Because that's what it means. Um, and we believe that TBM can help in, in those uh, cases. Um, which airports come to the front view, right? The size of the circle is um, corresponding to to uh, you know how close to the top of the list uh, the each of the airports uh, are and you can see that in northeast corridor it happens very often there are a few other places around the NAS where we see capacity being exceeded pretty regularly but most of the 52 airports are really not struggling a lot they may struggle here and there but not every day you know uh, in a as much uh, as uh, um, the, the red colored airports on this list. Um, but this is only one metric, right? Uh, if we were to rank airports using a different metric like volume or MIT stringency or um, airport efficiency improvement opportunity, which is delay assignments for flights that arrive during periods with um, low throughput rates, uh, all of these ranks, rankings would look a little different. And we can see that on the next slide. So on the next slide, we present each of the seven metrics and their own individual rankings, right? So you can see that the same airport um, could improve a lot. There is plenty of opportunity space with respect to one particular metric. There is a need to do something with respect to one particular metric, but maybe not with others or two or none or all seven. Actually, there is a uh, there are a couple of airports that really uh, show up on um, you know colored with bigger circles on multiple of these charts. So the next question we were dealing with as we were stepping through this thinking process was. What does one do with so much data? I mean, we don't really know how one thing trade offs against another. We don't know which one is more important than the other. There are no um, easy conversion ratios that we can apply, right? So what we decided was to not complicate things unnecessarily and to look at it all from the simplest point of view of how often each of the airports rise to the top of the list. And top of the list in first go around, we defined as top five airports. So how often is each airport on the top five neediest places in the NAS with respect to one metric, with respect to the other, and so forth across the seven listed here. And on the next slide, you get this little picture here that tells you exactly that. So you can see that the scale now goes from zero to seven. Zero meaning airport is never on that top five list. Seven meaning airport is on top five list in each of the seven cases. And now the next slide shows everything together. I'm deliberately not discussing locations because I don't feel ready to discuss location. We still need to think through all of this and interpret all of this. I'm just sharing with you what we did, our thinking, where we are in our analysis, so you can provide feedback and we can adjust as we go. Early next year, we're going to expand analysis again to other seasons. Looking only at winter is clearly insufficient. 
We need to be smarter than that. We may need to do things during winter differently than we do during summer, right? We need to know those kinds of things. But from average flight perspective, and if you focus on the title of this slide, opportunities per flight, this is everything on a single slide. So as busy and early as it may be, this is really capturing those trade-offs that we need to consider before we say, aha, uh -huh, site X is the site where we can do something. So we can then go into deeper level analysis to see, is it tools, is it procedures, is it both? What is that we can improve that would help us improve efficiency at that site? So with that in mind, the next slide shows exactly the same thing, but from the total opportunities point of view. Remember, if I want to improve that average flight, I'm going to be looking at small airport. If I'm only focused on the biggest bang for the buck, big airports are going to come to the front view. And that's really the key difference between the previous slide and this slide. But seven metrics that are appropriate for total opportunity analysis with how often each airport shows up on the top five list in the lower right corner. And the next slide now brings it all together. So if you just copy the little pictures from the lower right corner and put them uh, you know, on the left side of these slides, you see how often each airport shows up on the top five list uh, from the average flight perspective point of view on the upper left top five total opportunities, bottom left, average flight top 10 airports list, upper right, and total opportunities top 10 airports, bottom right. Why are we doing all of this? I mean, it looks like spinning wheels, but it's not really because, again, I'm underlying the fact that we don't really know, nobody in this room knows how to trade off between capacity utilization and MIT stringency or, you know, airport of, uh, opportunity to improve airport efficiency and delay assignments relative to something else. Um, we don't really know whether, you know, um, it's important to focus on a particular part of the NAS, even though airports there are not as big as someplace else, because that's a congestion zone, if you will. Um, and because of that, we are doing more to bring all of those important points to the front view so we can see them at the same time in a little complicated slide, I, I will admit, but nevertheless very informative so we can make the right call. That's in the background of too much. Kurt, did I forget to say anything? Can you hear me? Yep, there we go. Yep, no, I think you covered it uh, very well. I do want to just back up a little bit and talk about the metrics. Um, it, this this study was actually pretty exciting because um, I think, as we all know, the NASA is extremely complicated and, as Alma said, interconnected. Um, and there was a change of paradigm instead of looking at a specific airport and how can we just improve that. The metrics really kind of cross center boundaries and, and like Patrick mentioned earlier, um, you know, we have this mile and trail that gets passed back from Chicago all the way down to Florida. So how can we uh, improve efficiency? And the, these metrics actually pick that up. So it was actually pretty exciting to be a part of it uh, to to kind of help with the seven metrics and then come up with something like this where we can kind of really look at the map and say, all right, this is probably where we need to focus our attention in the future. So. So on the next slide, we go back to the process, I think, and tell you this is where we are. Those are all the calculations that we've performed, all the validations that we've done, all the beautiful charts that we created. And the next step is to repeat the same kind of thinking on additional seasons, um, maybe expand some of our metrics, include additional metrics uh, that could be of value. Um, and then work very closely with the airspace modernization team on bringing these two analyses together. So when we draw a line in the sand one day and say these are the um, sites that we believe we can improve performance at, you know, pretty soon in the future, um, we are on the same page with respect to that decision. Um, let's click one more time. 
I'm forgetting my own slides, so I apologize. Um, the next set of charts are really um, a little bit of showing off, I have to admit, because I'm really proud of this work. It took a lot of effort to get to where we are. And a little bit of a preview. You industry has requested for this information over and over and over and again, and we are finally in a position where we can pull it, package it in a meaningful way and share it with you easily. So our goal is not necessarily to discuss any particular slide from here, you know, um, and a, the next five, six, whatever it is, uh, unless you have questions, of course. But I want you to, we wanted to share, the agency wanted to share this information with you so you can form your questions to us and your recommendations better. And I wanted to alert you that even though this is the type of information that is necessary to uh, analyze in the next step at a deeper dive at each of these sites. So if you say location X is potential candidate, what can I do there? The very first thing one needs to know is like, okay, do I use use TBM in any shape and form there. What are my TBFM capabilities that are available? Do they have IDAC? Do they not? Are arrival flows managed by X, Y, and Z or not? So we have already accomplished that. What we didn't start doing, which is our on, you know, the next to do on our to do list is um, uh, segment these all arrivals into a location into contributing flows. So it could be city pair or some other meaningful category and then study individual flows that matter um, and then make decisions based on that because it's not that necessarily all arrivals can be improved, but a particular market pair uh, has that opportunity space bigger than others. So as we step deeper and deeper into that analysis, um, we um, will be looking at this and a more granular level information. But again, for now, for your, you know, um, playing around with, it's here. We have generated um, use and delay assignments and compliance for arrival metering to each of the sites. So if you see blank associated with airports, it means arrival metering was not used during winter 2021-2022. Uh, uh, on the next slide, we pulled uh, the same information for extended metering, clearly. Uh, very limited use in the NAS, as you know. Uh, next slide should be departure scheduling into arrival timeline for arrivals to each of these airports. The next slide is into EDC timelines for arrivals to these airports. So this is a confusing slide, right? EDC is closer to departure station, but if the lay assignment happens, we are looking at groupings for arrivals to each of the locations. And one more, applications of MITs. We are very excited about this uh, heat map on the right. Uh, we will be talking about that more today, but we are looking at who's requesting MITs, where those MITs are applied for arrivals to each of the sites. So we are, as you can see, going deeper and deeper uh, into analysis to really understand use of MITs so we can then uh, appreciate better how we could improve management of the same flows and use TBM to help us get there. Kurt, this is your bread and butter, right? Yeah, and just to add to that, um, for those of you that have heard of the Focus 5 uh, performance initiatives, uh, TBFM analysis is one of those uh, that we want to look at this year. And this was a big piece of that. Um, doing this analysis with MITRE, looking at these um, various charts, different metrics, um, and as Elmo said, that uh, stringency um, heat map up there, uh, very interesting as we kind of start to trace back those pass back miles and trail. And again, you know, where can we get the biggest bang for our buck when we expand TBFM? We implement IDAC into these towers so that we're not passing back minutes and trail to multiple towers that cause all these delays. Because ultimately, in the end, that's what we want to be is more efficient uh, and reduce delays wherever possible. So. Thank you. You'll see more of this in NCFs coming up in uh, later on this month and in October. And actually, you just reminded me of a very important part. Whatever you see at NCF, 
and you see here it's completely harmonized it's completely complementary it's actually the same underlying source of data so if you're looking at the chart and it looks like it's telling you a different story please let us know help you know let us help you lead through the calculations different time periods may lead to different conclusions the way this data is segregated may lead to different conclusions so all of the analysis here are really focused on how to improve flows from the time-based management perspective what role procedures may play versus tool use may play for the NAS efficiency angle we may be looking at slightly different group of lights or we may be uh, normalizing in slightly different ways that are appropriate for that NAS wide analysis here we are studying one airport at a time and flows are nest wide, sure, but it's flow at a time, right? So the, the, the conclusions may look differently, um, but it's how one interprets that chart is what matters. So let us know if you see any consistencies. We're always willing to have that conversation and learn from you about how to improve our tools and assessments. Next slide. Um, and you know after we redo everything for additional seasons uh, maybe even incorporate a few additional metrics um, we will be uh, you know scratching our head what to do with all of this data how to interpret what are those key locations and then analyze even deeper individual flows time of day perhaps maybe it's not a whole day that they need to look at just push periods uh, things of that nature all with the end goal of really boiling down to can I improve the way flows are managed, the way tools are being used? Um, is there anything we need to do about procedures or airspace design? So that decision about what, how and where is made at the same time together. Airlines uh, industry in general plays a critical role in this process. You can see uh, the bullet associated with collecting inputs from you. Uh, those inputs are really not collected in any single place uh, at all. We hear you at NCF and whatever we hear there, we use you know, to prepare our team industry day briefings for you and vice versa, right? Uh, so we all talk to each other. We all know uh, where uh, pain points may be at the moment and uh, we try to kind of design our analysis to to help each other along you know remove those pain points along the way together uh, but the bottom line is that even after we find those most the, the the neediest sites and even after we realize how to improve performance there we can go to one more click please um we're going to be back to the square one one day right and we're going to have to go back to measuring whether the needles moved, needles being plural, in the right direction, uh, whether we are getting what we expected to get from all of those things that we will do one day, um, and whether the bottlenecks have shifted, whether the congestion points have shifted, whether opportunity space look different, whether we need to revisit the same locations that we already done something at, or we can start focusing on brand new sites, right? And with that in mind, when we go back to square one, we are not eliminating any of the sites where improvements were already made from the consideration at all. That's the key point I want to make here. We're going to keep track of changing tra trends in the NAS across the board all of the time. So as you can see, this is very different from the uh analysis we did back in the day four five six years ago to select operating areas and select capability improvements specific to each of the operating areas it's a lot deeper broader view a lot more complicated view um it's better than half baked but it's not fully baked just yet so there is plenty of opportunity to improve on it so it's working progress and if there is anything I would like you to leave with uh, today is now that you have those complicated charts, let us know if you have any questions. Let us help you understand what you see in those charts. 
let's think through them together and then um, help each other make better decisions going forward. Yes? Hi, Alma. We have a uh, question pending online. Uh, it says, for long-term trending, any thoughts on how to normalize weather? Oh, plenty of thoughts, but uh, not enough capability to do so just yet. So the best we can do at this time, and you know, I of course welcome Kurt and Dave's and anyone else's thoughts for that matter. The best thing we can do right now is categorize um, flows and, and days, if you will, into good, you know, some weather, bad weather, eliminate flights that, uh, not eliminate from analysis, but study them separately. Flights that were conducted during uh, advert times with adverse weather. Uh, so the, the understanding of nominal performance of the NAS is not clouded by what happens during those days when things um, are a little crazier than that. Um, but um, th that's, again, the best we can do right now. Going forward, the question we need to ask ourselves is also uh, to what extent TBO can actually help performance during off nominal day. And is that the same extent as during nominal day, right? Because uh, not until we have better weather forecasting tools and many other capabilities will we be able to close that gap. For now, the gap is pretty wide and we simply have to acknowledge it and, and live with it. Yeah, I think that was a great question, by the way. Um, we, we actually think about that quite a bit um, because I think sometimes with weather deviations, it kind of clouds some of the, the data that we look at. Um, so we are kind of looking at ways to, like Alma said, remove it to study it separately um, and then just take the clean days and kind of analyze that to, to verify or to, um, you know, ensure we're as efficient as possible. Um, but to Alma's point, you know, how can we better uh, improve the system so that it can adapt when there is convective activity in the system so that we can continue to use uh, these tools that are more efficient than just putting out miles and trail every day or or whatever other TMIs that we do. Yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't clear if it was a convective weather question or just um, low visibility winds, but certainly when it's low visibility winds, it reduces the capacity, which then drives up the demand to capacity imbalance, which drives a need for our tools to, to handle that in the best way. Um, you know, one thing we one thing we can add to this is our policy office is always looking at where demand will grow. And I know we're we're talking about we need to wait to see where demand kind of settles. But um, we do have ways, I believe, with the measures that you've chosen that you could project forward and and look at demand to capacity ratios in a future also. Um, but I, I just want to something Alma has done in, the, in these last three to four years is really brought um, much more detail into how the tools are working. And I know you do that with GDPs, but with TBFM, this wasn't something that was really done. So having Alma in the AJT world, if we're really going to improve these tools, it's not just looking at do we redistribute delay, it's looking at the details of how the tools are actually working. And this amount of work with MITRE to see what you have up here is a huge um, step forward, so congrats. Thank you, Dave, thank you. So I, I, I we all appreciate how dense these slides are and, and charts and everything. Um, if we have more questions. No, no additional questions. Okay, thank you. Um, if if you know, if you wake up one day thinking, oh, I should have asked this question, um, you know how to reach to us. We can review any of this and all of this material all over again in JET meetings in different venues. We can set uh, separate meetings. Um, we can plan separate meetings too. That's not a problem. You have TBO email address. Uh, send us your questions. Uh, again, we are in it together. I just wanted to add a little bit. Um, 
And that was a great question online about the weather. Um, and I completely concur with Kurt. The nice thing is we are finally in a point where we have some solid science behind weather impacts and weather scoring. And Kurt has been leading an effort to uh, get more refined in that scientific approach. So we are very quickly approaching the point where we will be able to not throw out weather days where we can say, OK, we had a weather day in this region of some number and we can compare and contrast the data correlated with the weather. So it's I haven't seen this ever in my career, so I'm, I'm very excited that we are now able to not throw out that caveat of, well, on a clear weather day, we can measure these things. Now we can measure all these things and factor in the weather. So uh, a lot of great work's been going into that. So that's imminent to be able to bring in that weather component as well. It's a good point. I'm, I want to expand on what you said. I haven't seen this in my career. Um, it's amazing, really, how much we can generate now. And th th that's the beauty of all of this, that um, being able to look at um, long periods of time for a large number of sites at the same time really does provide pictures that we were not able to paint back in the day. So um, MITRE has been our partner in crime there, helping us advance our abilities to mine a lot of data. Um, we, it's really exciting that the correlation, the, the categorization of days and flows and, and studying each separately from something it should be bundled together with uh, is providing insights that we were not able to generate in the past. So it's exciting times, not, you know, not for a nerd like me, but also for being able to design analysis that are um, tangible and, and, and relevant to the operations as well. 